So, Cliff, um, in addition to uh, Wall Street, in addition to uh, manufacturers who want to uh, skip uh, some consumer protections, in addition to uh, food suppliers who want to uh, cut uh, corners to make more profits, in addition to, uh, to uh, doctors who want to enrich themselves, insurance companies who want to make more money and throw more people off of insurance rolls, in addition to wealthy people who are going to get tax cuts. Um, those aren't all the winners when it comes to uh, Donald Trump's election. I imagine I'm leaving some out. I would imagine uh, uh, there, uh, some of our, uh, the, the country's enemies uh, are pretty happy as well. Um, and uh, some of those companies that are hoping to privatize a lot of government uh, uh, assets and some of our society assets in the form of, of private parks. I, I don't want to go through the whole litany I think what you're trying this. to say, Sam, is if there's any negative interest out there that has a deleterious effect on America, they're probably dancing a jig right now. Is that what you're getting at? Yes, that's true. But I want to hear about a specific one, one that you have been uh, pursuing relentlessly, one which um, was, I think, or certainly felt like they were under threat uh, just a couple of years ago, probably now are, uh, are, are probably throwing parties n that, are, that rival anybody's parties, I would imagine. That's, of course, the National Rifle Association. Yeah, um, they, they are people I know well, uh, <laughs> who, I, who I often do battle with in various ways, and you are 100 percent correct. I, I don't think Trump's specific election could not have been a bigger victory for them, and, and I'll explain why. Um, you know, we got they, – they got a lot of their wish list, but, you know, over about a good 10, 15-year period in the early 2000s or 10, 12-year period. And then uh, there finally was a, a counterforce, and they started losing. Um, and the, in the end, the biggest victor – for, you know, with um, Barack Obama's not having been able to replace Justice Antonin Scalia with a new justice on the Supreme Court, I mean, certainly one of the biggest winners there is the NRA, because they had five justices agreed to this wholly ahistorical interpretation of the Second Amendment to say that it was an individual right to protect yourself. Nowhere you, – you can actually go back and see during the, the founding period where they were debating that and threw it out because they, they decided that, that the right to bear arms as it meant back then would be the right to, for state militias to rise up and protect states from, from external and internal uh, uh, attacks. And so it was always considered a group right very much like what Switzerland has today. That's where it ended. In Switzerland, you, you have your guns to serve in the, in the militia. You're not allowed to actually use them even to, to defend your house. And I'm not saying necessarily we would have gone to that here, but the point is it's not in the Constitution. And with, with Scalia gone um, and if someone like Merrick Garland had replaced him, there's a very good chance that that interpretation, which has only now existed for you know, seven, eight years and didn't for 200 years before that, was laughed out of court by the conservative Justice Warren Burger, who called it a complete scam, um, would, would, you know, that was something that was going to be overturned. Now you're looking at if they put on somebody in the Scalia mold, um, you know, protecting that particular interpretation. Um, but if he gets to put on a couple justices, if Trump does, you're looking at even – so, for example, Cook County in, in uh, Illinois passed a, a, a assault weapons ban. And the, they, the, some people, of course, uh, pursued that all the way to the Supreme Court to say that that was unconstitutional. Only Justice Th Justices Thomas and Scalia wanted to take that case to maybe say that, that it was unconstitutional. Not even Roberts and Alito wanted to touch it, or Kennedy. Mm. So they were able to put a couple more justices on if Trump is in that mold. So that, you know, that they could, we could push this even further to an even more ridiculous place. That is the reason why the NRA spent $30 million record-breaking for them on Trump. My guess is they had nothing to lose. They probably fully expected Trump, like many of us did, would lose. But in the small case that he could win, Hillary Clinton was not going to be good for them, and Trump was, was of course, going to be, and they knew they, that he'd owe them. And sadly, that's what's happened here. They still control the Senate. They have the House. Obviously, there are going to be filibusters in the Senate, but you've got even a couple pro-gun – I don't think pro-gun is the right term – anti-gun safety Democrats, John Tester from Montana, uh, right. who's going to be up for re-election in 18, Joe Manchin, who's backed away from some of his earlier support. So it's not good. And the irony of all of this, of course, is 
uh, on election night in, in 2016, you know, two weeks ago or so, that was a very good night for gun safety. I, I worked on a particular measure in Washington State to enact something called a gun violence restraining order. So it's like a restraining order for someone who's stalking somebody but with a gun and threatening them. They can have their guns taken away and have to petition a judge to get them back. We passed that with 71 percent of the vote. Nevada wow. passed a universal background check measure. California went further than anybody and passed a measure uh, that would require background checks to buy ammunition. Um, and so you had all that passed, and then probably maybe the number one sort of enemy of the gun safety movement, someone who said that she was going to support, but then betrayed, and Kelly Iote, she lost. So the truth is, is that it was actually a, a good night in terms of this movement moving forward, but you can't take away the fact that Donald Trump's winning is that, you know, the, the wish list now is, is something called concealed carry reciprocity, which has been defeated a few times, which means um, even if you get your, uh, uh, can, if you, if you get your concealed carry permit in Alaska or Alabama or somewhere where essentially breathing, not spending time on the range, knowing how to shoot a gun, taking a written test, you know, proving that you don't have any uh, kind of a criminal record or anything, but literally just almost seriously breathing and filling out a form gets, gives you a concealed carry, the ability to concealed carry. Well, now you can, if you move to New York uh, or move to California, a place with much more stringent rules around that, uh, they, they would say that, sorry, you already have that license, and like driver's licenses, they carry over. And that's been on the wish list of the NRA for a while, and you can expect they're going to try to pass that. And that's incredibly dangerous because there's a couple of states that, as, again, that literally have almost no uh, – there's almost no qualifications you need to be able to carry a, a hidden load, loaded gun. And, uh, and so that's, that's the first big thing. And then the second one um, is this ridiculousness that gun-free zones are where shootings take place, as if people who go on mass shooting sprees sit down and logically – think about where they want to do it. And of course, statistics show that 80 or so percent of these mass shootings do not take place in gun-free right. zones, but they want to eliminate gun-free zones too. That might be tougher, um, especially in light of the kinds of things like Newtown being brought up, but, but you can expect that all you need is a crazy enough member of the House or the Senate to bring it up. May I introduce you to Louis Gohmert, you know, or <laughs> uh, pick, pick one, you know, from the House or, or many of the of uh, the Senate caucus on the Republican side, uh, and so th that's that you can we can see ourselves nationally going backwards potentially if there's not successful We're, filibusters by the Democrats. Listen, we just have two minutes left in this segment, but I think the people that you know I know you've you've you've, you've said this many times on this program, but I think it's important to reiterate there there's the the NRA is essentially a uh, a trade uh, organization, right? I mean. Uh, presumably, it protects the rights of of gun owners, um, but really, what it is is it's funded by the gun manufacturers as a way of basically selling uh, weaponry, right? And That's all I would imagine, become. I imagine it also has value to Republicans more broadly speaking because it becomes a sort of a identity politics issue. Yeah, it has value in a few ways, and you pointed out. Look, there was a time where, in most of its history, from about the 1860s up through the 1970s, it was founded by two Union generals or a Union general and a colonel after the Civil War to teach people how to shoot better and safety. There was a time when it, it stood for those things. It doesn't anymore. It, it, it was taken over by radicals in the late 70s, and since that time, it's, it's rep more and more big gun companies give them most of their money. A much smaller amount of money is made from is, is brought in by individual uh, those who join the NRA or have lifetime memberships, and, and you know that's decreased. And they don't represent people there because 75 percent of the people, for example, who are NRA members believe we should have universal background checks like 90-something percent of the rest of us, and the NRA directly stands up against the wishes of their own uh, members. So, no, they're in it for the gun companies. And, yes, it's an identity issue these days, like opposing, like saying global warming is a hoax and like being not politically correct and and a number of other things that we heard Trump and others throw around this campaign. You know, it's part of the whole hyper-masculinization of the right, where carrying a gun is, is part of what puts you in good stead there, because you're a big, tough, manly man who can shoot stuff. Um, and so it works for them. But it also works for them, you know, with dark money, too. The Koch brothers run money through the NRA to spend on their types of candidates. So do other groups. So it's a great conduit, too, for funding radical candidates, especially for people who don't want their names on uh, you know, uh, who the specific candidates they're funding. So right. it, it provides them with a number of, of, of things and infrastructure in the end, too. 
Um, exactly. And so, yes, the NRA is I think that's something that the people right, don't... and they've got a chokehold on the right. I think that's something that people often overlook. You know, just the idea of, of, of there's another outlet with staff and funding makes a big difference. All right, we've got to take a, break, a quick break, Cliff. When we come back, I want to talk about the uh, attack that took place uh, in Ohio State uh, uh, University uh, earlier this week. Uh, the Islamic State, Daesh, as uh, we call them, uh, claimed responsibility for the attack. I want to get your sense of uh, of uh, of just what was going on there and uh, sure. what it means going forward. We're going to take a quick break. Sam Cedar, Ring of Fire Radio. We're talking to the great Cliff Schechter. 